Well, praise the Lord, yeah, sit down if you can. <laughs> Hadn't said that in a while. <laughs> oh, my goodness, I'm telling you. That's so great, y'all. I love that. Never stops. He never stops working. That, just, that, that line, those lines right there are just so pivotal to me. And because that is, so, that is such a truth. He, he never stops. I mean, it might look like it to us, or we may be questioning whether he's still working, but he never stops working. He's always working. That's what the scripture tells us about the Lord, you know? He ever lives to make intercession for us, and he's always with us, and he always loves us and is concerned for us and moves in our lives. And I, I just love that. I love that. He never stops, never stops. Even when you don't see him, he's working. Even when you don't feel it, he's working. He never stops working. All right, praise the Lord. So if you guys have been following along at all, and I, I don't know how many of you are, uh, uh, are we finished with this? I believe. I don't know how many of you are, have been following along with what we've been doing in the meantime, uh, when we left church, we, we were in a series called The Hurt Locker. And we're going to get back to The Hurt Locker. Um, I, I think the Lord has a word for that for us. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a series of messages that are going to be good for all of us. But in the meantime, while we've been these eight weeks or so uh, kind of in, in some disband form or of another, I started a series on, on greatness, on being great. And of course, when I talk about being great as a Christian, I'm not talking about being great the way the world defines greatness. The world defines greatness as having a lot of money, being extremely popular, uh, being a powerful person, you know, who has lots of influence and so forth. Uh, those are the kind of things the world uses to describe greatness. But when God describes greatness, what God's talking about is accomplishing the purpose for which you were created. I, I, I've said this to you before, and I know this is not a surprise, that all of us were created by God for a purpose. That none of us are accidents. That God looked at, God looked at time and God looked at what was necessary and needed in, in the world at, at the time and God placed you in your mother's womb. This is what the book of Psalms teaches us. It says that God formed us in our mother's womb and Jeremiah the prophet said, before I was even formed in my mother's womb, you knew me. And you ordained me and called me to be a prophet to the nations. So it's not, we're not here by accident is what I'm saying. And all of us have some sense of that. And if there was one question that you could ask God, for the most part, the question would be, why am I here? What is my purpose? God, what is it that you would have me do? That, that would be the question we want to know. And so we were all created to, for greatness by God because God created us to accomplish that for which he created us, our purpose. Some people call it the will of God for my life, all kind of phrases that are used about this. But it really boils down to, Lord, I want to do and be everything that you called me to do and be. Well, in order to do that, you, there are some there are some characteristics and some principles concerning being great in the kingdom of God. And I think there's really no better place to, to look for that and to see that than in uh, a study on Israel's greatest king, uh, probably one of the greatest figures in your Bible. Most people know King David. If you had a contest and said, uh, well, who's your favorite Bible character? Many people would say King David because you just know so much about him, the good and the bad. <laughs> That's one great thing about the Bible is that it doesn't hide the failures of its heroes. That's one thing that really, to me, gives authority to the Word of God, is that God doesn't try to gloss over things about the heroes that we have in the Bible. We need to see everything, the good and the bad, and what God does with that. Well. Uh, from David, we have now studied uh, four of the great truths, and today is the fifth. And the four that have come before just kind of get us back in the flow. Number one, every great person is made great on the battlefield. You don't become great sitting on the couch, you know, eating Cheetos. 
You, you don't become great sitting in a Sunday school classroom talking about the world out there. You, you become great actually on the battlefield. The second truth is because nobody's perfect. Look at your neighbor and kind of sign to them, don't talk. Uh, I guess you can talk because you're all in family groups. <laughs> talk and say, hey, <laughs> you know, he's talking about you here, all right? Yeah, everybody makes mistakes, right? And, and so a great person takes responsibility for their mistakes and grows from them. Number three had to do with our, the hurts from our past, and it just simply states that every great person overcomes the pain of their past in order to become great in the Lord. You have to deal with these things that damage you and limit you and hurt you and cause great difficulty in your life that if you don't deal with them, the devil uses them just to keep you bound for the rest of your life. Great people overcome these, these obstacles of the past, these pains of the past in order to be the person that God called them to be. And then last week, and a couple, the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about, about worship. And the fact is, great people worship the Lord. If you're gonna be a great person in the kingdom of God, you're gonna be a worshiper of God, and it's gonna cost you something to be a worshiper of God. And those of you that are worshipers, you could probably tell us a few things that it has cost you in order to be a worshiper of God. It's not easy, it's, you just don't fall into it. It's, uh, it's a powerful part of our life and, and, and there, you have to strategize, you have to, you have to uh, purposefully, intentionally go in to worship and, and, and put him in that part of your life. Now, today, we're gonna look at a truth that comes from most likely the the most well-known story in the Bible. Certainly it's one of the most inspiring stories of the Bible. It's the story of little teenage youth, King David, or he actually wasn't even king then, but David who had been anointed king but was still a teenager, going to the battlefield and hearing this giant uh, from Gath, this Philistine giant named Goliath from Gath, make these great boasts against the armies of Israel and insult the armies of Israel. And this is a great message, a great story about facing enemies in your life that are seemingly too large to confront or too large to even believe that you could defeat these at all. And the fifth truth of becoming a great person is every great person thinks in a positive, God-focused manner regardless of the circumstances. If I'm gonna be great in the kingdom of God, I'm going to have to have a God-focused thought pattern so that no matter what circumstance I face in life, no matter how big the enemy, no matter how fearful the situation, the first thoughts in my mind are gonna to move toward God and faith and what God says I can expect and do and what he expects out of me. Because there are many giants in our life that we confront. There are many enemies in our life that we confront that are just seemingly so large and so frightening and so dynamic that if we can't think focused on on, on God, we're going to be frozen in our situation and the enemy's gonna have a total advantage over our life. So David was not made great in this situation because of any physical issue in his life. David was a young boy, he was small. Giant. Goliath was giant, Goliath was the champion of the Philistines. The only thing David had ever fought were probably some of his brothers maybe and a, and a lion and a bear that, that tried to come get his sheep. I mean, he was not even a soldier. He was not in the army. He didn't have any military advantage whatsoever. He was just a, a, a boy that his dad sent up to the battlefield to check on his brothers and see how they were doing and take them a few snacks. 
And while he was there, this giant from the uh, enemy comes out and begins to make these gigantic boasts and claims. And David just happens to be there when he makes these. And David is looking around going, who is this uncircumcised? I mean, he just, it just appalls David that this enemy would be so disrespectful to God and the armies of, the, of Israel. So it wasn't any kind of physical or military advantage that David had that made David great. Great. The only thing David had that was different from any of the other soldiers up there that day is the way he thought. The way he looked at this, the way, the way he thought about what was happening that day was what made the difference between David and the rest of the soldiers of Israel. I, I you know... I, I don't have any way to prove this, and I know this might even sound blasphemous or crazy for somebody to say this, but I really think that any soldier in Israel's army that day could have done the same thing David did if he thought the same way David thought. And I'm going to read, some, I'm going to read the, the story now. I, I, I told Pastor Tanya, I said, I would love to assume that everybody here knew everything about this story, and I wouldn't have to read all these verses. But I'm going to kind of try to read, read them to you pretty quickly, all right? So let me just read them through because what I have to say to you, really, you, you kind of need to have this familiarity. All right, so here we go. All right, this starts in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and it'll be on the board for you. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. That's about nine that's about nine feet, nine inches, roughly. Big guy, right? He had, a bronze, he, he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. So the, the, the armor, the coat of mail, weighed 200 pounds. Big guy, right? You carry a 200-pound piece of armor, you, you, you're a strong guy. You're a big guy. And he, had, uh, and he had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Everybody say a fence post. The staff on his spear looked like a fence post. And the head of his spear uh, was made of iron and it weighed 600 shekels. So it weighed 25 pounds just the head on his spear. Uh, pretty intimidating, right? This was, this was an intimidating enemy. And he had a shield bearer that went out before him. So your, your possibility of getting to Goliath in a conventional way was going to be very difficult. How, how would you like to try to fight an enemy that the first thing you encountered was a shield bearer that protected him, and then if you did get through the shield bearer, now you're facing a guy that is nine feet, nine inches tall, has a spear in his hand that with a shaft that looks like a fence post, and has a gigantic 25-pound iron point on the end of that spear. He has, he has brass leggings, he has a coat of mail that weighs 200 pounds, has a giant brass helmet, and he's the champion of the Philistines. Quite an imposing character, wouldn't you say? All right, so that's the enemy that they faced. Um, and and uh, then he stood up, verse, verse 8, then he stood up and he cried out to the armies of Israel and he said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. And if he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we'll be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now, that's a fight to the death, wouldn't you say? I mean, if, if I win, you're going to be servants. You, you guys are going to leave here slaves today to the Philistines. But if you beat me, then we're going to all be slaves to the Israelites. All right. So this is, this is a uh, mano a mano deal. This is a fight to the end. This is a winner take all. All right. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And, and between verses 12 and 20 is, a, is the little story of David's dad back home giving him the information to get up there and find his brothers and so forth. So I'm going down to verse 21. For Israel and all, all the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hands of the supply keeper, 
He brought him to the, and, he, and he left him there, and he ran down to the army, and he came and greeted his brothers. Then, uh, he had three brothers up there, by the way. Then, as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. And all of the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he's come up to defy Israel, and it shall be the man who kills him. The king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, which I'm assuming would be a prize, and, 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 give, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. That means that you're not, you're not, you're not going to ever have to pay any more taxes and your, mom, and your mom and dad aren't going to have to pay any more taxes and your brothers and sisters aren't going to have to pay any more taxes. Everybody gets tax exemption and you get the king's daughter and you get greatly enriched with gold and everything that, that, that you can get. All right, then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? In other words, David seems to be so stupefied by what a great reward is being offered and how frozen those soldiers and paralyzed in fear they are. He's so astonished by that that he has to get them to say it again. You know, what did he say? He said, what, what, did, what did he say would be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach? And listen to this. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? that he should defy the armies of the living God. And the people answered him in this manner, saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. So they're going to go over it again. They're going to tell him, you know, okay, here's, here's, here's the reward, all right? Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. I mean, it just, it just flew all over Eliab, his older brother. What is that little punk doing up here at the line? I mean, when, when David, the soldiers told David what would happen, and then David said, wait a minute, wait, wait. Now, what did you say was going to happen? And when he asked it that second time, Eliab just flew into a fit. And Eliab, here's what Eliab. And Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart. I know how cocky and proud you are, is what he's saying to his little brother. I know how you think. You're down here just trying to stir up mischief and find trouble. Uh, 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 I know the pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down here to see a battle. You've come down here to see somebody die, is what he basically said. You've turned on the car race to see a wreck, you know. Yeah. You like to watch people get hurt. I know you. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Eliab, is there not a cause? I mean, this is important, man. There's a cause out here. Something needs to be done, Eliab. That's what David says to him, responds. Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. <laughs> In other words, Eliab hammers him. He said, this is... This is important, Eliab. Is there not a cause? And then he just turns right around and he starts talking to these other people over here again. And the people answered him as the first time that they spoke. Now the words which David spoke were heard. They were reported to Saul. And he sent, him, and he sent for him. This is amazing. Somebody goes and tells King Saul that there's a boy down at the battlefield that's asking questions about what would be done for somebody that would kill Goliath. And I think this is astounding because this obviously is the first time in 40 days that anybody has come with a faith question like, what would be done for somebody that kills him? All he's heard for the last 40 days is, he's too big to fight, we gotta get away. So for the first time, man, these soldiers said, hey, this guy's asking about what, how to kill him? My Lord, we need to go tell Saul that somebody's down here that, that's thinking that they can do something about this. And so they run up there and they tell Saul, man, this kid's down there and he's asking questions. 
And, 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 so, and so they, Saul said to David, they, he sends for him, and, uh, and then David said to Saul, uh, let no man's heart fail because of him. Don't, don't, don't let him bother you. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. No, oh, don't worry about it. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're a youth. And he's a man of war since he was a youth. But David said to Saul, your servant, now, now notice, notice the respect now. I mean, Saul is the authority of the nation. Saul has been, has been anointed by God. He's God's man for this nation, and David is one of his subjects. And David, when he speaks to Saul, he's going to show respect for authority. The first thing he says to Saul is, your servant, in other words, I'm your servant. I acknowledge that. I know that whatever you say, I'm going to do because I'm your servant. He says, your servant used to keep, and this is going to be a righteous appeal is what he's going to do. Notice, if you ever want to make an appeal to authority, pay attention to this, what David does. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took the lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and I struck it. And I delivered the lamb from its mouth and when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from this Philistine too. In other words, David said, King, I know I look small and tiny, but let me tell you what, what's happened. I killed a lion and a bear, and the same God that gave me the ability to kill the lion and the bear, he's going to give me the ability to take care of this uncircumcised Philistines if you will allow it. He made a righteous appeal to authority. And Saul, and, and Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. So it worked. He got permission. So, so Saul clothed David with his armor. Now don't you suppose that Saul had the best armor in Israel? That Saul was the biggest man in, in Israel. I, the reason he got elected king of Israel is that he was head and shoulders bigger, taller than any man in Israel. So Saul was the biggest man Israel had, and Goliath was the biggest man the Philistines had. Saul should have been the one out there fighting against Goliath, but Saul was back at the palace. And so Saul said, well, if you're going to go fight him, uh, you might better take my armor, because I have the best armor in the kingdom. You know, I'm the king, so... Everything that could be new and modern on armor, mine's going to be the best. So here, try it on. Let's, let's see. So Saul is obviously thinking what? Saul is obviously thinking that David is going to go hand to hand with Goliath, right? You don't need any armor unless you're going to go down there and, you know, swing a sword, stab a... I mean, you don't need any armor if you're, if you're not going to go hand to hand. So Saul says, all right... There's only one way to fight this giant. And so, here's my armor, and you go down there, and the Lord may be with you. Now listen to this. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword onto his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested him. And David said to Saul, I, I, can't, I can't walk with these things. And, and I, I don't know how to fight with this stuff. I've never tested these things. So David took them off. Then he took his staff, which everybody say a stick. A staff is a stick. So he takes a stick in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and he put them in the shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him, his shield bearer. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. 
for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. Have you noticed every time they talk about David, they say he's good looking? I think this probably had a factor in it. I, I think that probably shook Goliath up. Uh, the fact that this good looking boy was coming down this path, I think it made him even madder than he was. What that punk coming down here? Pretty boy up there, think he's going to do that. I'm going to mash him in the ground. I mean, in other words, David is throwing Goliath completely out of his game. He's a warrior, man. He doesn't need to be thinking about whether somebody's attractive and they're a boy and they got a stick. And I mean, he's fixing to be in a battle, man. He's got to be focused on what's going to happen in the battle. And David is just strolling down the path with a stick in his hand, whistling probably as he came. Good looking little fella, you know, reddish hair, kind of freckly and light skin. That's what ruddy means, kind of light with freckles and red hair. Good looking little boy coming down and Goliath is just infuriated by this. And let's see, where am I? Oh, here I am. I'm gonna find it. I need to mark it. And and when the Philistine looked, he saw David, he disdained him, for he was only youth, he's ruddy, he's good looking. All right, verse 43. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you would come to me with sticks? Uh, this, by the way, is pretty good strategy. See, he, David's got a stick in his hand and Goliath feels totally overconfident now. David is completely non-threatening. He doesn't have a sword in his hand. He doesn't have a spear in his hand. He has nothing. He has no weapon. He has a stick in his hand. And Goliath gets mad about it. What am I, a dog? You come down with a stick? What? And you're sending a boy down here to send, fight against me? That's an insult against me. So he's beginning to lose it. And, um, and the Philistines said to David, Come to me, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. Goliath thinks it's going to be a hand to hand combat, too. Get down here, boy. Get my hands on you. I'll tear you in pieces and feed you to the birds. That's what Goliath's got in his mind, see? He's thinking this way. And David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I'll give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. David said, you come in with sword and spear, I'm coming in the name of the living God and God's going to give you into my hands and you and your whole army. So it was when the Philistines arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David was ready to go. Then David put his hand into his bag and he took out a stone, put it in that sling and <laughs> this is what Goliath's hearing. <laughs> That's all he heard. The still air was split by the sound of a swoosh and a thud, and that was the end of it. Goliath fell down on his face to the earth, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and took over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they ran for their life. Quite an adventure, because why? David was overpowering. David was the muscled up champion of the Israelites. David had won all the battles as a gladiator in the middle of the ring. He was well trained. He was well armed. He was a powerful tactician that was a great soldier. No, David won against an overwhelming enemy. Think about the enemies that come against you that are overwhelming. 
you're never going to make it. You're always going to be sick. Your business can't succeed. They're going to take your house away from you. Those children will never make it in school. I want to divorce. I mean, think about the giants that you face in your life. Those overwhelming obstacles that seem too big to even challenge, much less think that you've got a chance to overcome them, and you'll feel like David felt that day. And David looked at that, and the only thing that is different between you and David, or me and David, is this territory right here that is right between our ears, the way we think. And I'm just saying to you that there are four characteristics in this story of how a winner thinks that will make winners out of losers. <laughs> if you think like a winner, God, you're thinking like a great person that's going to be great in the kingdom of God. If you think like a loser, you're going to be paralyzed. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna freeze up in the face of the enemy and you're going to be under bondage most of your life. So what are the four, what, how do winners think? What are, the, what are the four ways winners think? I'm going to give you one, okay? I'll give you the other three next week. All right, here's the, here's the first one. The first one is winners have a faith-focused, have faith-focused thinking. Great people think through faith and, they're, and they focus on faith rather than on the enemy. Now this requires two elements. And both of these elements come out of a passage of scripture in Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm just going to quote it, it's not going to be up on the screen. This, the, Hebrews 11 verse 6 says this, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God, here are the two things, number one, must believe that he is, and second, and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The way my thinking has to be as a child of God in order to involve God in my life and for God to face my enemies and me to face my enemies, whatever they might be, money, sickness, uh, uh, desperate children, uh, uh, marriage problems, business pro whatever the enemy might be, in order for me to face an enemy as a child of God and to become an overcomer and a great person as a child of God, I have to first of all have faith-focused thinking that involves two things. I must believe that God is and I must believe that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So my thoughts have to be, have to be God directed. I have to direct my thoughts toward God is what it really boils down to. I believe that he is. First, I got to believe that he is. He is what? He is here. He is living. He is now. He's not, he's not, I, he was and he will be one day but that he's here right now. He is the living God. He created us and he loves us and he'll fight for us and he'll protect us and he'll do everything the Bible says that he will do for us. I must believe that God is active, alive, with me, loves me, walks with me right now. Not just one day when I go to heaven. Not just when I got saved years ago. But he is currently right now with me. You heard what David said when he walked toward the battle lines, right? He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of the living God? David said, he's alive and he's right here and he's going to put you into my hands this day. 
He said, you come to me with a staff and a sword and a shield, and I come to you in the name of a living God that will give you into my hands this day. He's gonna, God's going to grab you, and God's going to put you in my hands. Now, how could he say that? How could he say that to Goliath? Well, he had to believe what Hebrews what, 13 says, where Jesus said, hey, I'm never going to leave you, and I'm never going to forsake you. He had to believe that. Wherever you are, I, you, can, you can count on me. You, I'm, I'm with you. So that giant that you face now, that uncircumcised Philistine that you face right now, that says to you, you're going to die early, you're not going to make it, your business is going to fail, you should have done something else, you're not smart enough, your family's blowing up, you have nothing you can do about it, just give up and leave. I mean, that uncircumcised Philistine that looks at you, the first thing that God says is, listen, I am alive and I am living and you must believe. With, but without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he that comes to God must believe that he is. And then secondly, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That just simply means that God always has a reward for, do, for us doing the right thing. Now, that, I know that, might, that little phrase may sound a little self-serving. Like, oh, you mean we serve God for the reward? No, you don't serve God for the reward. But if you, if you obey God, he says there is going to be a reward. God says, look, if you do what I asked you to do, and you seek me, and you hear me, and you obey me, you can always count on the fact that I'm going to bring a reward to your life. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. What did Jesus say about that? Jesus said what? Seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what? All these things shall be added unto you. What else did Jesus say? In John, Jesus said... Uh, uh, anything, uh, whether you have, you have two or three together and anything you ask in my name, what did he say? I will do it. These are promises that God makes. What about the book of Psalms? What does it say? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law, he meditates day and night. That means he, he's in the word. He knows the word. He studies the word day and night, the Bible day and night. And then what is the next line? And whatsoever he does shall prosper. God promises that if we do the right thing and we obey him, that he is going to reward our life. And the difference between winners and losers is that losers focus on the risk and never do anything because they're so afraid they're going to fail and it's not going to work right. And, I, and, and what happens? He's too big. He's too strong. I could never fight against him. He'll kill me. He's the champion of, of, the, of the Philistines. And the losers look at the risk and only weigh the risk, and they never think about the reward that God said, I'll give you if you will obey me and walk with me and come with me. I'll fight your battles for you. I'll fight the enemy for you. So if you focus on the risk, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to become paralyzed. You're going to be fearful all of your life. Just like the armies of Israel that stood frozen while Goliath taunted them and cursed God and cursed them and disrespected them. And they stood there frozen. And when David heard what was going on and how big a reward God said he would give, he looked at them and he was shocked. He was so shocked by the fact that the reward was so great and they were so paralyzed that he had to look at somebody and say, what did you say the reward was again? 
I mean, am I missing something here? <laughs> you know, why aren't these guys jumping on this thing? So what does that mean to us? Well, that means whenever I have an issue going in, on in my life, how, how do I look at it? What, what I, this is too big. Oh, I, I wish I could do something about it, but this is just way too much for me. It's too big. I can't do anything about this. I don't know better. How can I do this? This is too challenging. This is, my marriage is too far gone. My kids, I'm going to have to just give them up because there's nothing I can do with them. I don't know anything about them. I, I mean, you know, it's just too much. I'm just too much temptation. It's too big of a problem. It's too large of a problem out there. See, that's that, that, that's that, that's that paralyzing thinking. Thinking as if there is not a God. And that God has never said anything about the fact that he's going to bless you and be with you. See, if you see it, it all, it, you've heard me say that your relationship, I mean, your, your fellowship with God can be no better than your concept of God, how you see God. If you see God as a punisher, if your concept of God is that God isn't faithful, that he's looking for a reason to put the hammer on you, that he's just waiting for you to mess up because he just loves squashing sinners. That's what he does every day. Wakes up and said, I hope somebody messes up today because I'm just really wanting to strike a lightning bolt on somebody. If that's your concept of God, then you'll never see God as a rewarder of your life and it's gonna, and you know what that does? That keeps you from doing the right thing. See, the devil's only option, the devil's only option is to throw a problem at you that is so big that it will cause you to take your eyes off of the reward of God and put it on the risk. This thing's gonna kill me. My Lord, I can't do anything with that. Holy smokes, man, I don't even know anybody that can do anything. And see, it, see the risk instead of the reward. That's the enemy's only strategy right there. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That's what the Bible says. I can do all things. What does all things mean? All. What does all mean? It means everything. All things. All right, so truth number one about a great person is great people look through faith-focused eyes and see the reward of God more than the risk that Satan offers our life. All right, so there are three more. We'll look at them next week, all right? Three more of them. Thank you, guys. All right, would you please just bow your head with me one second? I hadn't changed, have I? I still preach way too long and have way too many points <laughs> for stuff. Hey, glory to God. So welcome back. <laughs> you know, come back to the same place you left. There you go. <laughs> oh, God's so good to us, man. I'm serious. I've been waiting for y'all to come back. You can tell I'm fired up to see y'all. I am. Y'all have really, y'all really light, light me up good. It's been hard preaching to seats out here, by the way. You just don't have quite a... You know, preaching and, and sharing messages is a team sport. I don't know if y'all know that. In other words, I'm sharing with you, but you also sharing back with me. I mean, looking at you, looking in your eyes, looking at your countenance, looking at you know, what, what seems to be happening in the gears of your heart and life. I mean, I sometimes miss it, but... But it, most time I can kind of read what's going on. And, and when I see that, it, 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 it gives me guidance. And, and the Holy Spirit does th that, you know. I mean, it's really amazing. And I'm, anyway, one thing that being, being out for like these eight weeks, and I've been preaching to chairs, well, Pastor Tanya, but I mean, how much can I really get on her, really? <laughs> but anyway, but... Uh, but anyway, it, it has shown me one thing for sure, and that is how much you guys mean to, to, for a church. A church really is a body. We really are in it together. 
It's not just standing up and preaching a sermon or something like that or playing music. Without you guys, I mean, it's just not, the, it's not even close to the same. And I love y'all and I'm glad. I hope you, I hope you have a sense of uh, community also that you, know, you, you enjoy being together and want to be back and all that. All right, so we're going to see some giants. You know, we're, we're living among some giants right now. This COVID mess and all that kind of stuff, that's a giant. I don't know if y'all know that. Did y'all identify that as, as a big giant that looks like he's too big to confront, right? Certainly he's too big to think you've got a chance of winning. God says, God says, hey, stop thinking like the world thinks and start thinking about me because I can carry you through this. So there we go. All right. All right, let's bow.